Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Bill Reeks, and I lead a company called the Gramercy Institute. We are a think tank for senior marketers from major financial firms. Um, we are here today to talk about a very important topic. The topic is leveraging creative automation in financial services. And it is no coincidence that we have two very important people here with us today uh, to discuss this topic uh, uh, in, in detail uh, with all of us. Um, the two panelists that we have are Jason Ricks. He is the global go-to market lead for Digital Interact, which is part of TAG. Um, we also have uh, Bonnie DeJoseph, who's the creative strategy director at Vanguard. So that said, um, we're in very uh, good hands in terms of this discussion today. Um, we will be running for just about 45, maybe 50 minutes. And I do very much encourage our audience members to um, ask questions. And if you would, please ask your questions. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A um, toggle button and just type your questions um, in that way. Um, feel free to uh, tell us your name and your company as well when you do so. And that way um, we, will, uh, we will know that as well. Um, I think then the best place to start is at the beginning and that's with introductions. Um, Bonnie, I'm going to ask you, if you would, would you kindly tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do at Vanguard? Um, absolutely. And thanks for having me, Bill. Um, so I'm Bonnie DeJoseph. I lead creative strategy at Vanguard in our in-house creative agency. So in short, my team helps to write the creative briefs that help drive the creative campaigns that we do within our different business offers. Um, I've been a Vanguard for my whole career, so I have kind of moved up the ranks in marketing, starting with social media, helping to launch Vanguard's social media strategy, sitting in our retail advertising team for a while, and then helping over the last few years, helping to kind of stand up this in-house creative agency, which has been really cool. And um, I will say I will today, you know, I wouldn't say I'm by any means the creative automation expert, which I'm glad Jason is here for that, but I'll be kind of bringing the perspective around, you know, a, an average creative person and how to, can we benefit from these types of tools and technology to, to really help us do our work better. Well, Bonnie, thank you so much. It's terrific to have you on board, and we're very fortunate to have you on board. Um, I will shift now to you, Jason. Would you please tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do at TAG? Thank you, Bonnie. Thanks, Bill, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Jason Ricks. I'm the global lead uh, for Digital Interact, or DI, as we refer to it commonly at TAG. Uh, Digital Interact is essentially our end-to-end uh, -end marketing workflow uh, solutions stack. Stack meaning that it comprises multiple uh, modules or solutions that solve for problems and open opportunities for clients as it relates to marketing production. Um, my background is 20 plus years in digital media technology. The first 10 spent in the early noughties um, looking at programmatic and performance-based advertising. Uh, and then most latterly in the scale of creative production or creative technology space, working with businesses and brands to help them better leverage um, technology as it, as, it, as it relates to content in market. It's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it, Jason, we are lucky to have you. And thank you so much Hi. for lending your expertise to this conversation. Um, Bonnie, let me shift to you for our first, um, uh, our first question, which is uh, an essential question that I need to ask. What is creative automation? Well, I will say kind of the layman's terms of how I would define it is you know, really using technology, AI, whatever that may be, to help us streamline and optimize our creative output and our creative campaigns. All right. Simplest terms, but that's yeah, yeah, no, no, and that, that's what, that's what we need to know. We need to establish yeah. what it is exactly that we're talking about. And I'll ask you, Jason, now from your from your agency uh, perspective, um, do you agree? And what what might you add to to that this, this definitional question? Yeah, sure. So I think that's um, that's right. I do agree. I think there's a, there's a couple of ways of us of us looking at looking at this. So, firstly, from a practical perspective, creative automation simply refers to the process of using technology in some form to complete certain manual or rep often repetitive tasks in the creative production workflow. So, in principle, that means that you're taking uh, a process that has traditionally sat with a creative or production expert and you're using technology to do some of that heavy lifting to get you from A to B. The idea and the objective there is that you're able to do that in a faster, cheaper, better fashion. Blowing that up to kind of 30,000 foot for a second, I think it's important to look at 
the, the broader picture in terms of the context. So creative automation isn't something that's just kind of appeared overnight. It is an ongoing, evolving process. So if we, we take ourselves back, um, you know, 30, 40 years, you've got the first year of manual production, very much a linear process, very much a specialized division of labor. And obviously with the advent of personal computers, and as they went mainstream with the integration of software, we started to see the second era come about in creative automation, which was led by the likes of Adobe, Microsoft, Apple, where you had those software packages that were there to streamline and empower creatives to be more, more effective, more expressive. We're now in what I consider to be the third era, <clears throat> which is this trend, transition from software to cloud. So where now a lot of these, a lot of this functionality and this automation is accessed through the browser. And with that comes lots of opportunity through simplified workflows and integrations with the, with the broader ecosystem. Yeah, Jason, thank, <clears throat> thank you so much for explaining that. Um, and let's stick with this particular uh, uh, idea here. Tell me more, more practically speaking, what is it that either an agency or a financial brand <clears throat> needs in order to execute what we, were, we, are, what we are defining as creative automation in an effective way? Yeah, sure. It's a great question. So there, there are principally three facets to creative automation that typically apply to most solutions in market. The first one is that it's cloud or, or, or browser based, which means that it's, it's not a local deployment, um, which has implications for the number of people and the scalability of the solution. Second, secondly, and typically it's template based, meaning that the, the logic and the rules are laid out from the get go, which give your team the ability to set the parameters and the guardrails for controlling brand and ensuring brand compliance through that, that, that creative production process. Um, and then the third area is, is that you'll typically find these solutions are very user-friendly. So the user interface has a, has a strong design principle in mind. These solutions typically aren't designed for creative or production experts. They're designed for brand marketers or marketing teams. And so a lot of, um, a lot of attention and time is spent designing a solution that's very intu intuitive and, and, and easy to use. Yeah, uh, Jason, thank you so much. And Bonnie, from your perspective, um, what tools do you need to, to, uh, to, to use this technology? Well, I'll, I'll just kind of say, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be, I, I won't necessarily go into the tools, but I'll kind of say the partnerships that you need as well yeah. from a financial services firm is, I think it's really important to have compliance really be your partner throughout this entire thing to make sure that, um, you know, there's a lot of things to think through. How do you make sure that you're capturing these different types of versioning and things like that? So I think there's a lot of relationships that you need to have across your company to be successful in this type of testing. So bringing them in early and often to make sure that you're set up for success and to make sure that whatever you're is going out is compliant is tracked and is is being targeted to the right people and bonnie let me ask you this what is compliance's reaction to the concept of creative automation do they welcome it with open arms uh, uh how does it work with you yeah so it's interesting i will say one of the biggest challenges that we face is you know figuring out like all these different versioning and so i think our i know our compliance partners have been you know wonderfully acceptable accepting of these new ideas but as i kind of mentioned bringing them in early and talking about you know what are we trying to do what are kind of the, the key principles we need from a compliance perspective and how can in this new space how can we make that work um, so just having a lot of those conversations, but it is an interesting thing, especially when you start versioning of, hey, if you have maybe 200 different versions of something, how can you make sure that those different versions are being captured and tracked and, you know, stored properly according to all of our guidelines to make sure that that's successful. And we've been able to kind of figure that out, but I would just say, um, yeah, keep your, your compliance partners are your best friends, you know, in these types of areas, but it absolutely can be done. Um, but just, you know, getting a little creative in, in the how we, we make that work. Uh, Bonnie, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. Yes, Jason, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to comment on that. I think it's really interesting. So um, the automation piece um, typically sits within a larger uh, technology solution. So the piece that I thought was really interesting that Bonnie picked up on is, um, in some respects, being able to create more content at scale creates another problem for you, and that's around um, management or control of assets. Who has access to what? How do you understand where you are with versioning? Who uh, internal versus uh, it, internal versus external external stakeholder management? And that's typically where the DAM, the digital asset management platform, 
comes in. And so what you often find is that those two tend to marry up quite nicely, where you have this solution in play, which gives your local teams devolved uh, powers, capabilities to do more for, uh, do more for less uh, using uh, some form of an automated automated solution, but obviously supporting that, underpinning that is a central storage solution, which we refer to as a, as a DAM, a digital asset management platform, where you have all of that metadata, all of that methodology for search retrieval and enabling that broader ecosystem of, of agencies, partners, uh, and employees to be able to get access to those to, the, to those assets. So you're solving for two you're solving for two different problems. One's about control, whether that's assets, stakeholders, or data, and the other one's about empowerment, empowering empowering the teams. Yeah, that's uh, a great point, Justin. I, I, Jason, I had never even thought about that before, so I love that call out. Yeah, th thank you, thank you yeah. both. Um, Jason, let me point this next question at you. Look, sure. I am sure there are a lot of, of uh, uh, people in our audience who are, you know, just sort of just considering dipping their toe in the water into this, this notion of, of creative automation. Talk to us about the benefits. I mean, what are the benefits that come to mind um, as you advise your clients um, in sure. this particular area? Yes, that's a great question. So I think, first of all, again, taking a step back and understanding the, the model. DI, um, DI Automate, which is our solution for, uh, in, the, in the automation space, works on a, on a centralized compliance model and a decentralized usage model. Now, what do I mean by that? The rules and the logic are, are managed and set centrally, which means that your brand marketing, your brand marketing team, all of that expertise and know-how gets funneled into one place before it gets pushed out to your teams. And so the rules are set from, from, from the beginning. So a key benefit there is obviously control. Right, irrespective of the scale and the volume that you're able to achieve, you still retain uh, that level of compliance and consistency that's so critical. So that's a big box ticked. The other one is obviously decentralized usage, which refers to productivity. And as I mentioned, enabling your team to do more for less. Uh, beyond that, it's about speed to market. Right? So um, for those attending this call, if we think about how long it typically takes to brief out to an agency or a partner, for a small adapt or a reversion of, a, of, a, of an ad or a piece of content and the process and the administrative hassle that's typically involved in getting that back through approvals and then compare that to having a self-serve solution which is hosted in the cloud where all of the rules are already set so you've ticked that box on compliance and your teams are able to execute that themselves locally you can start to see the speed to market and the time and cost savings associated with that. The other ones I'd call out are things like interoperability. What do I mean by that? The ability to integrate and speak with other platforms and other systems. So whether that's you know, being able to, using an automated solution and integrating that with, for example, a social media channel, so you're automatically pushing content out or you're connecting with your CRM system so that you have, <clears throat> excuse me, ready to use assets to support in market sales conversations. Again, the fact that it's in the cloud and it's interoperable means that it can speak to other systems. You've clearly already got, I imagine, various marketing systems in play in your company. Having that ability to uh, position that automated solution uh, in a complementary manner as opposed to a substitutional manner, I think is, um, is, is really key. Um, and then of course, it's just, it's about cost reduction, right? Yeah. So automation over time will steadily and eventually significantly um, reduce your marginal cost of production. That being the cost of iterating and, and producing that next version, that's, that next version, that next version. And if you're a big company or a big brand with large multinational operations, local team requirements, complex operations on the ground, producing lots of, lots of assets across lots of channels, that all starts to add up. Uh, Jason, thank you so much. And Jason offers a very thorough answer to the benefits, a very compelling argument. Um, Bonnie, I'm going to ask you though, anything to add to that? What could you add to the to the benefits? Because you're from a different perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, Jason said it perfectly, but I will add kind of from a creative's perspective. I think um, what's really helpful in this state is sometimes we have a lot of different offers that have been out there for years. And, you know, at this point, we're trying to figure out how to optimize, right? Moving, moving the dial just a little bit. And a lot of times that comes down to changing CTAs, changing headlines, and writers can absolutely, you know, do that, right? They're amazing at that. But a lot of times they want to work on the big media campaigns, new ideas. That's where, you know, writers and designers, they want to sink their teeth into that a lot of times. So um, just building on 
yeah, what was said is I think it's a really great opportunity to use creative automation in these times where, hey, we're just trying to optimize what's already really great creative and allow your creative teams to do the big, bold, exciting new challenges and, and let automation kind of help in, in these kind of small tweaks here and there. Yeah, that's, that's if, sorry, if I can just kind of comment on that, I think that's really, really interesting. So the idea of freeing teams up for high impact work, more strategic work, less of kind of the, the administrative stuff. I think that's, that's, that's really true. And we see that certainly play it with our, with our clients. The other bit I wanted to call out was what I referred to as kind of the second and third order, order benefits. So, you know, we've called out kind of the speed and marginal cost, uh, the reduction in marginal cost um, and control. That's all great. But what that leads to as a second order benefit is data. You're creating more content. You're having more contact with market. More contact with market means more signals, more data, better understanding of what's working, what isn't working, um, and understanding of utilization rates. So you've got a, an investment of X, which led to Y in terms of number of assets used or assets engaged or assets downloaded. It starts to give you an understanding as to whether you're investing in content or making decisions um, that are cost effective. The third, I see kind of uh, order of impact of having more data is that the conversations that you're able to have internally within the business become more objective. So rather than having an exchange of opinions as to what works, what doesn't work, you're able to refer to the data to, to steer you in making those decisions. Uh, and as you start to make more decisions based on the data, you start to see less wastage um, and that ultimately leads to competitive advantage. Uh, Jason, so, thanks so much for adding that. Let me, let me ask you both a question which has frankly been implied by what you've mentioned already, but I'll still, I'll still ask you, what about personalization and customization um, as, as a benefit? I mean, financial is such a personal business in so many ways. Um, what, is that a, 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 a primary order of benefit that you would, uh, uh, you would list? Either one. Yeah, I, I, yeah if, if money doesn't mind, I'll, yes, I'll, I'll, take that quick, I'll take that quickly. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, the, the template approach essentially enables you to create an unlimited number of templates. And within that template, you have a logic. But once that's then locked in, it gives your teams the ability to uh, treat an asset as, a, uh, as comprising of lots of different elements. And each of those elements have the ability to move the dial on engagement in market. As Bonnie's already mentioned, that could be the call to action. It could be the font type. It could be the logo. It could be the image. Giving teams the ability to A-B test and personalize content based on understanding of and use of, of first-party data is you know, absolutely, uh, absolutely critical. Um, and as I say, having a system in place which enables you to scale that up, where the cost of serving that volume is decoupled from the volume itself because you're using an automated system, um, I think is, um, yeah, it's really key. Yeah. Jason, I'll, thank you. I, and I'll just add to that, and, and a challenge that I think is, is part of this personalization is I would say what we found helpful is to use automation in offers that have kind of already been established and you have a place to play. You know, there's maybe not as many stakeholders, there's room to test CTAs. I'll say where automation hasn't worked for us as well is when there's maybe a new offer or there's something that um, maybe your business stakeholders are, you know, there's a very clear way we need to talk about it. Maybe from compliance, there's a very specific way we want to talk about it. It may be difficult coming up with 10, 20, 30 different ways to say something or images that we feel we can personalize with. So I think that's also, there's this really unique benefit of personalization, but where are you ready to personalize to that level of scale and that many options? So really finding that right product or offer to do that, where you have a lot of ability to kind of explore is I think also kind of sets your team up for success as well. Yeah, Bonnie, thank you. Um, Bonnie, would you say that uh, uh, the creative automation is, uh, could be potentially right for every financial brand or is it you know, only only right for certain kinds of brands doing certain sort of things. And how would you explain uh, or determine is it right for my brand? Oh no, that's a great one. Um, I mean, I I think it could be right for everybody depending on your goals. I would just say instead of leading with the question of, hey, should we do creative automation? I think you start with what problem are we trying to solve and seeing how creative automation can come in. So kind of looking at it from the lens of, hey, we've had this offer out there for three years and it's doing really well. 
but we think we could maybe push it a little further. How do we optimize? That may be a signal that, hey, creative optimization could come into play. Um, hey, our creative teams are getting bogged down and doing a lot of this, you know, just updates of creative and design image swap outs. Like that could be a sign of creative automation. So, so yeah, so to answer your question, I would say it could be right for everybody, but I think you just want to really like start with like, what problem are you trying to solve and make sure Automation is a solution as opposed to trying to roll out, we need creative automation, and then you're trying to pigeonhole yeah. stuff to work, and then I feel like your teams can swirl. Yeah, yeah. Th uh, Bonnie, thank you. And Jason, I'm going to ask you the same question. <laughs> Clearly, people come to you and say, is it right for us? Um, how, how do you advise them in this say, uh, uh, sense? Yeah, it's a great question. I think so, so obviously, aside from the, the value, the inherent value and role of technology in streamlining operations, uh, the potential for driving down cost reduction, uh, driving down costs, um, especially obviously during a global e economic um, downturn, um, potential downturn. Um, taking a step back and looking at the kind of market that the business is operating, I think it's very helpful. So for small challenge, uh, for businesses that are in smaller markets or challenging in certain markets and need to be a bit reactive and scrappy and a bit faster, getting something out the door ahead of their competitors because they're really going after share of market big tick. I think businesses that are leaning in heavily to social and digital advertising, again, there's a big tick there because, you know, you've got the ability to A-B test and personalize across a lot of these platforms. Uh, many of them change their formats uh, on an ongoing basis. A lot of, a lot of them are video, video heavy, video centric, short format. So there's a real natural need to um, figure out what works. Um, and this gets to an interesting kind of interplay between the role of, uh, interplay or, or friction between functional and creative value functional value being the need to maximize engagement reach clicks inquiries from paid advertising creative value being that need to um you know drive emotion engagement um adhere to to, to, to brand values etc there's always a, a natural natural friction there the, the third one i would call out um, is the operational footprint so businesses with global operations multinationals with tiered markets um, may have you know in some markets strong relationships with agencies um, and in others local teams that are feeling um, that they need a little bit more more support um, and that comes to an interesting uh, point around um, the role of human expertise in all of this. Um, often automation is not a solution that's a panacea for all of your uh, problems out of the box. It often needs to be managed, uh, managed in a professional way. And that's certainly something that, that TAG have uh, become, uh, become experts at, uh, whether that's providing guidance around onboarding, uh, dealing with change management, uh, providing a steer on template creation, or just being that, um, that sounding board um, as the business is going through that change management process in perhaps in, in local markets, I think is, um, is really important. Uh, Jason, thank you. Listen, Jason, you, you've pointed out uh, several times already about the efficiencies and the cost savings uh, component to, uh, uh, to creative automation. Do you think that in, in, in times of an economic downturn, it can be particularly, uh, can particularly helpful? To, uh, to financial marketers to uh, embrace this technology? Yeah, I mean, so the, the, obviously the operating environment for the financial services industry is not dissimilar to, you know, pharma, life sciences, you know, highly regulated, tightly controlled, that's, um, looking like to, to increase over time. So there's a, there are consider, considerations there around legal requirements that impose certain restrictions on what can and can't can't be done in terms of um, creative creative output. That in turn places a limitation on ability to scale and to realize those, those cost efficiencies. That said, with a templated solution, as I mentioned, you have this centralized function where you can, you can cross that bridge quite early in terms of bringing all senior stakeholders around the table to understand exactly what can and can't be changed within a certain template. And once that then goes out to market, all teams should be should be aligned and comfortable and confident in the knowledge that whatever the variation or the adaptation or version of that asset as it lands on that channel in that market, it's still going to be it's still going to be brand compliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jason, thank you, and I'll, I'll ask you, Bonnie. Do you have any um, uh, any thoughts on this particular question? 
I would just say, you know, from a glass half full perspective of, you know, from the economy and everything going on, I do think there can be some positives of this as well, of, as I kind of mentioned before, um, around letting your creative teams do strategic, big impact work and allowing the automation to do the rest. Um, you know, I think it can be an opportunity for you to just really think about how am I best using my talent? Where can they focus their time that they are going to be the most engaged and most satisfied and just doing amazing work and, and letting technology do the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Bonnie, thank you. Listen, um, guys, let's, let's turn to talk about some more, uh, 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 practical um, cases. Uh, maybe I'll ask you first, Jason. Um, any examples come to mind of some success stories uh, 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 that, that that document how creative automation can can help a brand? You don't need to mention brand names unless you want to. Sure, no, sure. So, well, there are two two, two um, instances, different use cases actually. So, one's a financial services client we've been working with uh, for for a couple of years. Um, where, and their main, the, the main output, the main creative output was for print and digital. Um, and they were creating literature uh, for email and for print that only required very specific updates and changes to things such as date and locations, along with the use of a variety of different brand templates and logos. Um, so that was a very specific use case where we set up a template and the teams only had access to changing certain things on the document. Quite a small thing, but over time, that, that cost-saving compounds and you know, I'm just looking looking today at the latest stats. I see that we, you know, on average, we're we're, we're turning around the production 80% less time. That's a significant saving on a monthly basis. You're looking at four to five days, four to five days that would otherwise have been spent on manual production. And to Bonnie's point earlier, that team is now freed up to focus on higher impact, uh, more strategic, more strategic work. Um, the other one is a a, a global consumer. Uh, brand and uh, the FMCG um, space, different approach, different use case, wanted to focus on digital video, a uh, tool to enable content localization at scale, 70 plus markets. Their approach was to fund it centrally, globally, so that they, they remove the burden on the local markets uh, from a cost perspective, so that those local markets had more money for media activation. Um, but again, a templated approach. So we created 150 plus templates, that set the rules for how that content could and could not be adapted. Some were more complex than others, which reflected the degree of competence within the business across different, different teams. But again, you know, nearly an 80% saving on a per job or per adapt basis over time. So two very different use cases, two very different industries, both using the same, the same model. Centralized control using the template, decentralized usage model, uh, in the case of the FMCG, they funded it centrally. In the case of financial services, it was split across the business. Jason, thank you. Both great examples. Um, I appreciate that. Bonnie, let me turn to you. Um, uh, in your work at Vanguard, um, and again, feel free to answer this to the degree that you feel comfortable, but um, uh, any success stories to report um, uh, about uh, that can help us understand better how it works? Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't mind, I might share one uh, not a success story, I guess. And to, to demonstrate, I think yes. I like success story Great. as well to kind of lead into it. So, you know, I remember early on when we just got started exploring creative automation, you know, someone came to us and said, we need to do creative automation. And we had meeting after meeting to talk about what this could be and all of these variations and trying to talk to compliance. And that's what I was kind of alluding to earlier is like, have a problem you're trying to solve before you jump into that. Cause I'll say that wasn't the time where we started using automation because I think we started with the wrong conversation. Right. And so we just swirled. And so, um, you know, what we realized in that campaign is, Hey, we could barely get the business to approve one line of copy for this sensitive topic. So let's not try and make things harder for ourselves by trying to come up with a bunch of different variations. So we learned a lot from that. So I would say from that perspective, it was very successful. I'll say fast forward, we've gotten smarter, we've learned a lot. And so we have another offer that we're looking at and we weren't quite sure how to talk about it. And we were more flexible, but we knew what the compelling proof points were. We, we knew what the value prop was. So we're able to kind of put that in and allow these variations to come out and say, hey, here's these different 16 variations that AI is recommending for us to use. And we're able to run those and see, hey, which one of these options is the best way to talk about this offer? So that was a really great example of it, it was very clear when we were 
we're trying to accomplish. We're really clear in our goals and creative automation just came in and really supported what we were trying to accomplish at that time. Bonnie, and thank found you. a great winner. So it helped inform our future content strategy. So I should probably end with that. It worked. So oh. yeah. That, that is terrific. And thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, that example right there as well. Um, terrific. Listen, guys, we have a question um, from the audience. Right. This comes from Bernadette Bridie at FS Investments. Um, what does the setup look like with creative um, automation? And let me ask, point this towards you, uh, Jason, first. Um, how would you respond to Bernadette? Um. I would well. So, in, in terms of the setup and implementation, um, there's a um, so it, as I, as I mentioned, it's a ma largely a managed service, which means the first kind of port of call is um, what we call a discovery workshop, which is to really understand the status quo within the business. So, we need to really identify that problem statement. So, what problem are you trying to solve? How are you currently set up? Who's involved? What do those timelines and objectives look like? So, really mapping that out. Then we we then look at the then look at our technology and the, and, and the solution that we have. We map, we map it over to understand exactly where and how we can best solve for those problems. And invariably, it's the process for us is a technical discovery, a client discovery workshop, out of which will come a recommended solution for how we take our core technology, in this case, our DI Automate, the automation platform, and put it to work to best effect to solve for those for, the, for those problems. What you tend to find is that um, each business has a different take on uh, approval workflows. So who's involved and who's doing the, the adapting, who has access, where those assets go and sit. As I mentioned earlier, there's a, a dam integration piece that's at play as well. So we take all of that into consideration when we're defining the solution, but you're looking at a, a stage of uh, discovery, technical discovery, solutioning, getting into the platform, Q&A, um, and then an incremental release. So releasing it into the wild within a confined environment to understand how that's being adopted, um, any teething issues before it, it's, it's uh, released uh, on, a, on a wider basis across the organization. I would say that the change management piece is critical. And that's an, that's an area that TAG has real experts, expertise in, which is working with clients to understand what the potential barriers to adoption within the business that can either be internally or externally. So with local agencies, for example, or your partners, they need to come with you on that journey. Or potentially it's a relationship that's going to be changing and morphing slightly and you need some guidance on how best to, to manage that. You, you, what you get from TAG is that combination of best of breed tech with human expertise to help you both set the solution up, but also go on that journey. Jason, let me ask you this. Is there ever any pushback from creative teams when they learn that we are going to be um, instituting some automated creative work, automated creative work? work? Um, you know, do they ever get, and I'll say scared because they don't understand exactly what it means. Yeah, that's fair. I think um, initially, yes, there is some reticence, but that comes from a misunderstanding, perhaps, of of the of the term. Uh, creative automation would indicate that the process of being creative or creating something um, is being taken on by the tech. But the reality is, it's doing the hard yards, it's doing the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. um, and what we tend to find is that after fairly soon after adopting the technology, what the creative teams realise is they've got more time to spend being creative. And coming up with that strategic work and that high impact work and the the repetitive stuff that um, you know the adapting and the versioning and the and, and the tweaking of small assets uh, the small tweaking of assets I beg your pardon um, is, has now been put into the cloud and they can get it and focus and focus elsewhere so uh, you you find that there's a uh, there's a transition there's a journey that the creative teams tend to go on as we do any new new technology. Yeah, yeah. Jason, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll look to you now, Bonnie, on Bernadette's question about the setup and what's required. You have a, a more practical perspective, perhaps. Um, uh, how might you respond to this? Well, I will say I am very grateful that there's a lot of talented people at Vanguard that know how to set all this stuff up, stuff up and I don't have to worry about that. But I will kind of add on to, to what Jason was just saying, and I think that it does also inform the setup of, you know, the creative pushback. Um, so yeah, when it kind of gets to my team, everything's kind of functioning. And so it is kind of a, 
a discovery phase in the sense of, hey, well, what are you trying to learn this year and how can we help you, which is really great. But I think the pushback that happens at that phase of implementing is that the creative team wants to know the why, right? Because we most of the time, at least what I've seen is that creative teams do appreciate automation and they understand it. To Jason's point, once they understand the true meaning of it, but I think where the frustration can sometimes lie is they don't always know what to do with that information. And so you might spend time getting something set up and you're getting all this data and they're saying, okay, great, but what are these themes that I can become a better creative myself for the future? Because we look at that data to say, hey, can how can we be smarter at what we do? So so Jason, I, I would love your thoughts. I know we've talked about this a little bit. Yeah. Of how do we take the what and how what what can creative teams do to be better at the why moving forward to be smarter? Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think um just just to go just to go back a second, I mean the important thing to remember here is that this is a cloud solution. So it's already set up and ready to go just needs to be pre-configured. And the implications of that are that th th there's no better way of, of educating, introducing um, stakeholders within the business than giving them access to the, te to the technology. And so one of the, the, the benefits and the beauty of SaaS software as a service is that it's, it's ready and it's readily accessible uh, for teams to try. And so at TAG, we often um, open up uh, demo or trial environments for, for teams to have to go into the system to actually go through that workflow, that workflow themselves. And so answering that first, that first piece of the question, taking it from the abstract and the conceptual, that I kind of understand it and I kind of get the benefits to really seeing the tangible benefits of seeing how that, how a, that augmented workflow is different to how they currently work. And then the benefits start to materialize become more, more tangible whether that's um, you know say freeing up their time reduction in costs being able to do things being able to do things faster um, I think the why um, to answer your question around the why it's it's getting clear on that problem statement right it's getting really super clear on that um, on that problem statement and typically what you find is businesses um, can't create and get stuff out the door quick enough right um, and that's a universal uh, I think that's a universal challenge so clearly there's a so clearly there's a piece there, but I think alignment around the problem statement and the role that technology plays, specifically with regards to automation, um, I think is, um, is an interesting angle. Also, I think just opening up conversation about automation in general. Um, here we're talking about uh, marketing production, but there are many different elements within marketing production that if we look around, we can see already being automated. So it very well may be that the creative teams are already using some form of creative automation whether that's automated transcription, automated subtitling, automated voiceovers, music, the whole industry is being impacted by this ability to uh, do things in an automated fashion. So I think opening the conversation up more generally, get people excited and aligned to the, to, to the vision, and then really honing in on the problem state. Yeah. Jason, thank you uh, uh, for that response. Um, Bonnie, let me ask you this, and, and speaking on behalf of our audience here, there may be some companies out there who are thinking about dipping their toe into the water of uh, 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 creative automation. What advice might you have for them? What, is, uh, what would be your, um, your thoughts to them about moving forward into this direction? Yeah, I mean, I would say definitely have a problem you're trying to solve that leads to creative automation because you will, I really do believe you will face a lot of swirl if you um, are trying to solve the wrong problem. Um, so make sure it's the right fit for creative automation. And I would just say, um, you pull in your compliance partners early, make sure that they're in the loop and that they, um, you know, have a really good solution of how you're going to be tracking this and how you're going to be understanding this process moving forward. But um, yeah, I think it can be, I think it can be a really nice support um, option, but it just needs to be the right offer the right space to play in. Yeah. Bonnie, thank you. And, and, and Jason, what might you add to that? Yeah, I'd say, um, so Fully, full automation is not going to be appropriate or viable for every project and campaign. So as I I'll go back to kind of this, the importance of the human expertise or the consultative side of things, um, it's definitely required from in, in the beginning, for example, in, in building out the templates and, and getting an understanding of, of, of what logic and best practice um, looks like. But certainly the change management piece, I would, uh, I, I would come back to. Um, it's, it's getting clear on it's getting clear on your North Star in terms of the metrics that you want to move the needle on. So speed to market, great, but really honing in on that and reducing 
cost of creation, great, but really honing in on that. And what you often find is that businesses getting to the detail when they get into uh, uh, creative automation because they're able to, they have access to that data, they have access to that insight. And so don't be afraid to be ambitious with those goals. So really understand the status quo in terms of where you're at and then be ambitious with those goals. And then try the, try the technology. As I say, it's um, what you often find with these SaaS solutions, certainly is with DI Automate, you're able to try the product out um, socialize it within the business, gather feedback, and really um, build an informed opinion of how best it works within your business. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jason, thank you uh, for that. Bonnie, now, you know, we, we started with a very general question, and we're, we're getting close to the end um, here. I want to ask you a question that, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we'll come back to you in 20 years and see if you were right. Maybe we won't. I'm not sure. But I'm going to ask you where this is going, right? Uh, 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 you, you've, you've both taken us through sort of the evolution of this technology um, and as to where we are now, but where is it heading? Where are we going to go and, uh, with uh, uh, creative automation? And what could the world look like in our industry years down the road uh, uh, from this perspective? Oh, that's a, that's a great one. Um, I mean, I will say, I, I think there's, it's only going to grow with, from automating things, but, but I think it's from the space of that as we get more data, more information around our audiences and smarter targeting, I just think the ways we can communicate with our audiences will just be, the opportunities will be greater. So I, I, I don't necessarily see, oh, automation is going to take over the world. Like there will be a world for creative teams to do all this really great work. But I just think all the things that marketers are going to want to do, you're going to have to, how do we use automation in the right place? How do we use our creative teams in the right way? So if I had to predict, I feel like it's going to feel maybe similar today, but just bigger, right? More automation, but it's like every, our opportunities are expanding. And so we have to expand with the tools we have. I'll probably be proven wrong, but that's, that's the world because I feel like things will always shift the pendulum, right, of, of where you're going. But I just think we're getting smarter and we need automation to help us with that. So. Well, I, I think that's a, that's a very fair response. I will ask you back here in five years and we'll have this same discussion <laughs> and I will, I, will, I will pull this recording. Um, yeah. Bonnie, thank you for that. And Jason, how might you respond to the same question of, of where this technology is heading or bringing us? Where are we going? Yeah, I mean, if I, yeah. if, if I believe all, all the articles I've read recently, we're going to the metaverse, um, or the sound, sounds of things, and, and very quickly. Um, listen, I think the foundations are strong, right? So the, the, the cloud infrastructure is there. If you look at the growth of the likes of AWS, um, so, so the, the foundations uh, for uh, future growth in this, in this, with this kind of technology and these kind of solutions are definitely there. That would indicate that you know, we're expect to see, for example, um, these niches that we see in the production workflow expanding. So um, more competitors, more innovation popping up in those, uh, the different aspects of that marketing production uh, value chain. I would expect to see AI popping up a little bit more in terms of um, assisting um, and helping in that creative process. That could be anything from um, managing the resizing process, which we know is a is a bit of a of a challenge, uh, to retain kind of that, that legal compliance when you, you're going from one format to another, from channel to channel, uh, all the way through to um, predictive production. So using data and giving you back recommendations and ideas about what to create. Right. I think AI has a clearly has a role to play there. Um, I would expect to see more integration. So certainly, starting to see the market move towards more of a partnership led model where we're seeing these ecosystems form um, integrations between best of breed partners um, we're certainly going to see ongoing growth in virtual right whether that's ar vr um, you know that's 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 a definite the pace and the rate at which that that grows obviously up for discussion um, so those would be mine and um, would obviously welcome the opportunity in five years to round back and see the extent to which that was true or not bill Let's do it. Let, 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 let's, let's do it. We have a date. We, we have a date. Hey, listen, you two, um, you know, I, I could close it out now, but there's one more question. And I wanted to ask you that's come in from our, uh, uh, from our audience. Um, but I'll ask you maybe to um, maybe more in a prompt reply, um, if, if you would. And forgive me as I read this, this comes from um, our friend, Melissa Wall. Um, I see the benefits of uh, version control and quick changes around data numbers and the like, but are company marketing strategists and compliance team teams truly okay giving the freedom to anyone writing headlines or changing wording that don't fit with an overall marketing strategy? Um, 
Bonnie, might you have a, a response to Melissa on this? Oh, it sounds like you've been living my world. I think it's a great <laughs> question. And as I, you know, that's why I kind of say, I, I think it depends on the offer because there, I, there are certain offers, campaigns that is probably not the place because you probably do have business partners. You have a really clear marketing strategy and you're like, this is what we want to say. We want everyone that to hear about this offer. We want this line in it and we want this imagery. And you may just say, hey, this is not the right place for creative automation because our marketing strategy is so tight and our offer you know, kind of proof points are so tight, we want to stay here. So I that leads to me like, that's where I wouldn't say let's go there. I would say a place where um, you maybe don't have as much clarity, or there isn't maybe as many stakeholders or compliance a little bit more flexible, maybe there's not as many guidelines in this area. Um, that's where I would kind of look towards because I would say certainly there's some places that it just won't work because you, you know exactly what you want to say. And yeah, sometimes you might get an output with automation, but that maybe you don't want to say in the future. So kind of be careful what you wish for too. So make sure it's a place that, you know, you're, you're okay with, with shifting. If you, you learn something new. Uh, that is great advice, Bonnie. And, and thank you. And, and Jason, what advice might you have to, um, uh, to Melissa on this particular question? Sure. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah. I, I think that's a fair concern with the decentralized usage model. We've got lots, potentially thousands of, of people creating content. Um, and the question is, how do you, is it right? I guess the question is the balance, right, between trying to achieve that level of efficiency and output whilst trying to maintain some of some order and control as to exactly what goes out. The way we solve for that, um, at least at TAG with DI Automate, is we um, integrate uh, bespoke approvals. So you can execute uh, bespoke approval workflows. So even though the usage model is decentralized, working off a template, we can set it up so that that asset doesn't get published or downloaded or exported or shared until it's gone through an internal approval process. So you consider that to be a kind of a decentralized, a central to decentralized, back to centralized model, if you like. There are obviously implications there around resourcing that, but certainly for certain campaigns or certain use cases, you may want to um, put that in, in place. Uh, Jason, thank you for that uh, response to Melissa's question. Now, listen, my friends, I'm afraid that this brings us to the end of our, of our journey. Um, at this moment, I wish to thank certainly our audience. Um, guys, thank you for your great questions and thank you for being here with us. But more than anything, I want to thank this dream team. Um, Bonnie DeJoseph from Vanguard, Jason Ricks from TAG. You guys uh, have been a terrific, terrific source for, um, for not only our audience, but also for Bill Reeks right here. Um, I wish to thank everyone for joining us today and we will see you next time. Uh, thank you for coming. Bye-bye.